Hello, and welcome to Bios Frontier Science. I'm Kate Shannon, and today I'm excited to welcome Mitch Gutman, a professor in the Division of Biology and Biological Engineering at the California Institute of Technology. Mitch, to kick things off, could you please give us a quick introduction to yourself and what you're working on? Sure. So first off, Cage, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to connect with you and talk with you on your show. So just a little bit about myself. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a professor of biology at Caltech, uh, where I run a research lab about, of approximately 20, 20 people. My lab works on understanding the role of long non-coding RNAs uh, or link RNAs and, and the role that they play in shaping 3D three-dimensional nuclear organization, genome structure, and regulating gene expression. So uh, um, I guess over the course of today, we'll talk more about all these different topics, but you know, our, our work has, has solved several major sort of open questions in the field of, of gene regulation, and particularly uh, in understanding mechanisms of how these link RNA genes actually work uh, and how they can actually shape uh, how our DNA is packaged in our cells and how they get decoded to actually provide uh, different types of information in different cell states. Um, I have a fairly unique training background in, in that um, uh, my, my training has been in both experimental and computational biology. And so my lab has sort of uh, adopted this integrated strategy. Uh, we uh, have an integrated team of experimental and computational uh, biologists. Um, and we use this integrated strategy uh, to provide an integrated perspective uh, to solve many of the questions of interest uh, in, 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 our, in our areas. Um, so for example, you know, one key aspect of our lab is that we develop new technologies and new tools uh, that are critical for tackling many of the critical questions uh, that we're interested in. Uh, for example, and, uh, and maybe we can talk about this more later, but uh, we've developed numerous tools for studying RNA protein interactions, uh, as well as novel tools for measuring uh, 3D spatial organization of the genome, as well as you know, DNA, RNA, and protein in, uh, in the nucleus. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to get into the details. Uh, but before we start talking about your specific projects, one thing we like to ask our guests is, do you have any North Stars that guide your research? <laughs> yeah, um, that's an interesting question. You know, um, when I first started my PhD, you know, I was exploring different topics that were you know, worth tackling. And, you know, at the time, one of the first things that my graduate advisor, Eric Lander, uh, said to me uh, was sort of this paraphrase of this very classic Wayne Gretzky, Gretz, Wayne Gretzky quote, right? Which, um, and, and in particular, sort of encouraging me not to focus on sort of where the scientific field is, but rather where the scientific field will be. Uh, and, you know, while this is sort of seemingly obvious advice, I, I feel like it's, off, it, it isn't, um, as widely utilized as, as, as maybe uh, should be. But, but in many ways, this has become the guiding philosophy of sort of how I think about uh, the work we do and, and what we tackle. Uh, and it really does shape the types of questions and approaches that we take. Um, you know, in many ways, a, a mantra in our lab is to tackle the most interesting questions or most important questions that we think of uh, and invent the tools that we need to do so, rather than sort of avoiding focusing on questions simply because they're they're accessible with current technologies or current approaches. Wow, that's an, that's an awesome guiding principle. So diving into some of the things that you have going on in your lab right now. At a high level, your lab is trying to understand how non-coding RNAs control gene expression. But before we kind of get into the specific projects, can you first explain you know, what are non-coding RNAs and why is this an interesting topic of research? Yeah. Um, so I'll break that up into two parts. Um, uh, you know, let's start with what are non-coding RNAs. Um, so it, it, in many ways, the easiest way to define what a non-coding RNA is actually is to take a step back and define what they're not. Um, and, you know, most of us learn about the so-called central dogma of molecular biology, uh, usually in high school uh, or, you know, early in your, you know, intro biology course in college. Um, and this was a term that was sort of first coined by Francis Crick back in the 1950, late 1950s. And very simply, the simple formulation of this central dogma is this idea that the genetic flow of information is such that sort of DNA in, contains the code of life, right? It's the, the sequence that we carry around in, in every cell in our body that has the instructions for who we are and what we, what we need uh, and what we make. Uh, um, but that this DNA gets decoded in different cell types uh, 
to give rise to a um, what at the time was actually referred to is a transient intermediate um, uh, RNA molecule called a messenger RNA. Uh, and this messenger RNA uh, acts as sort of the, the intermediate between your genetic information and then the, the final endpoint, which is sort of the proteins that get translated off of this message. Uh, and these proteins are often thought of as, as the critical actors that, that um, do all the functional work in the cell, right? They're the, the molecules that you know, break down your food. They're the molecules that control uh, you know, transcription in terms of uh, driving, you know, uh, they're the polymerases, they're the replicases, they're the molecules, the transcription factors, the chromatin regulators, all the, you know, the, the metabolic factors, right? And so um, in a way it sort of describes sort of the genetic flow of information from code to functional components. And you know, while this is, is mostly true and it still very much frames the way we think about molecular biology even today, um, you know, not all functional molecules are proteins. And conversely, not all RNAs are simply intermediates uh, to proteins. And, and this is really what um, uh, non-coding RNAs are, if you will. They're the exceptions to this uh, central dogma. Uh, and they're called non-coding RNAs for a very simple reason, and that's because they're RNA molecules that are defined by the fact that they do not code for proteins. Um, and in, in many, many cases, these non-coding RNAs, rather than you know, coding for proteins like a messenger RNA, act directly as functional RNA molecules to carry out you know, many different central processes uh, in a cell. Um, and so they themselves can act as sort of functional molecules. And rather than being sort of intermediate, they're sort of the endpoint. Uh, in this flow of information. Now, to your second question, which is why is this an interesting area, area of research? Um, I think that is certainly a uh, much longer question. And, and obviously there are many answers to that. And obviously this is a, a, a very a big area of research across the scientific community. Um, so I won't do full justice to that, except to say that at a very high level, uh, in my view, at least, one of the main reasons why non-coding RNAs are so interesting is because they fundamentally act in a distinct way from proteins, uh, right? And that's owing to their distinct chemistry, right? Uh, rather than being made up of amino acids or made up of nucleic acids, um, RNA itself can sort of adopt structures, but it can also uh, form uh, uh, base pairing interactions with nucleic acids, uh, which is something proteins obviously cannot do. Um, and so because of sort of this distinct chemistry, they also have distinct cellular localization, uh, which we can talk more about later in terms of where they, you know, proteins are made in the cytoplasm through translation, non-coding RNAs, you know, can act in the cytoplasm, but they can also be restricted in terms of uh, working solely in the nucleus and carrying out uh, unique roles uh, therein. And because of these sort of unique features of RNA, uh, they can really play a highly diverse uh, and, and very unique regulatory roles across an entire spectrum of different biological pro processes. Um, and many of these simply can't be achieved by proteins. Um, and I would say more than even just that, um, you know, one of the things that makes non-coding RNAs just so interesting is the sheer numbers of them, uh, right? The, the, the total number of non-coding RNA species that are encoded, for example, in the human genome uh, very likely exceeds uh, by quite a lot, the num total number of proteins that are encoded in the human genome. Um, and it, you know, in a way, it almost suggests that the central dogma is the exception rather than the other way around, right? Um, um, but not, you know, it, you know, there are so many of them, but they can play so many different fundamental roles. And these can be central to so many of the, the core processes of, of sort of human biology. And of cell biology, and, and you know, just as some examples, you know, we don't tend to think about this, but you know, the uh, you know, it, it's non-coding RNAs that act as sort of the central components of the ribosome, right? The machine that actually converts messenger RNA into proteins, right? It's the RNA itself that is responsible for um, catalysis, uh, formation of peptide bonds between amino acids during the translation process, right? It's non-coding RNAs that are central components of the spliceosome, right? The machinery that actually mediates uh, the, the, the uh, splicing reaction, right? The, the, the conversion of a, of a newly made RNA into its actual 
messenger RNA, right, that codes for proteins. And these RNAs are central for not only forming the spliceosome, but also for recognizing the precise locations on a pre-mRNA that need to be cut out. And so uh, non-coding RNAs are, are just so fundamental to every aspect of, of life that, um, you know, it's fascinating to really think about sort of all the different kinds of things they can do and the kinds of different kinds of roles that they can play. I agree. It is fascinating. But what was your motivation or how did you get interested in this space? Well, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, you know, um, uh, obviously got interested in, in, in link RNAs and non-coding RNAs in graduate school. But when I started graduate school, to be honest, it was not something I ever expected to do. Um, you know, I kind of got into this field sort of by accident. And um, you know, to, to take a step back and sort of explain how that happened, um, you know, I started graduate school at the end of 2006 uh, at MIT. And, and uh, for those of you who remember that time, this was sort of post human genome era, but pre uh, next generation sequencing era. So this was actually the time when the first, uh, what are now referred to as next generation sequencers or high throughput sequencers started, to, or single molecule sequencers, uh, started to come online, right, with the, with the introduction of 454 uh, and so what was called Selexa at the time, it's now the Illumina platform. And, um, you know, at the time, you know, this was still uh, very, you know, very new and very few research institutions in the world had access to these instruments. Um, and, and so, you know, I was a graduate student at the Broad Institute uh, with Eric, Eric Lander, as I mentioned, and um, obviously the Broad Institute is being one of the premier genomics institutes in the world, uh, had one of the very first uh, Selexa instruments at the time. And so, of course, you know, one of the things that they wanted to do was, was really tackle and explore what are the kinds of transformative questions and methods they can develop on these new um, NGS platforms. And so when I started uh, in the lab, uh, you know, Eric with Brad Bernstein and others at the Broad were pioneering, you know, many different applications of these technologies, but in particular, um, uh, they were a pioneering development of methods to adapt uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation or CHIP uh, for generating these genome-wide maps, uh, methods that are now referred to as CHIP-seq. Um, and, you know, it's hard to appreciate today how, how, um, how, how you know, it's hard to appreciate today just sort of how unique that was at the time because we do that routinely all the time now, right? In fact, it's probably anyone in this field would probably be hard pressed, you know, to find somebody who probably hasn't done a chip seek experiment in one way or another. Um, but at the time, right, the way that you would go about doing these types of chromatin profiling experiments, if you were lucky enough to do it, uh, was either uh, to do focused analysis by PCR of specific regions, you know, or, you know, if you were even more savvy and advanced to basically take it and throw it on a microarray. Microarrays, um, for those of your younger audience who probably never heard the term, you know, were um, revolutionary technology at the time, but they were also limited in terms of their, their total coverage and space, right? So you couldn't really, um, uh, with few exceptions, profile the entire genome, right? You were focused on doing what was called chip-chip, focusing on, for example, pr known promoters or known coding regions or known regions of interest. So you kind of needed to know a priori what you were kind of looking for. And so uh, in many ways, the ability to start looking everywhere um, was transformative. And, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, Eric and Brad's teams were sort of adapting these approaches to looking at chromatin profiling genome-wide. And that's when I joined the lab, right? And what was interesting about this is they had all this data for the first time and, you know, wasn't exactly clear what I should be doing as a, as a new graduate student, but, you know, Eric, when I started in the lab, encouraged me, said, you know, just, we have all this data. No one else has these kinds of data sets. No, we don't really know exactly what we want to look for, but I'm sure there's a lot of really important things here. So why don't you just go see what you can find, right? Explore the data, see what you can find. Um, you know, he was confident that there were many hidden gems in there. What exactly those were, I guess, were, were to be determined. But, um, you know, my background, at, you know, at the time when I started in grad school was in computational biology statistics, um, more than experimental biology. Uh, and so I started exploring data and, you know, in particular, at, you know, with an eye towards developing methods that allowed me to mine these data at scale, trying to find, you know, patterns that exist uh, in different regions of the genome. And, you know, I didn't really have a very specific uh, 
uh, you know, goal in mind per se. Didn't really know enough at the time. Um, but um, you know, once I sort of developed these methods, you know, I found several interesting patterns of, of chromatin modifications and different types of locations in the genome. And uh, I showed these to Eric, and of course, uh, he got immediately got excited about one of these um, sets of patterns, and that was the fact that there were uh, thousands of regions in the genome that had these, uh, uh, what we refer to as these K4, K36 modifications. These are sort of histone H3 lysine 4, K4 trimethylation, and histone 3 lysine 36 trimethylation, which uh, was interesting because these are signatures that tend to be associated with actively transcribed RNA pol 2 genes. But what was and so every protein coding gene pretty much has this, that's, that's transcribed, has this signature. But what we were finding is that, yes, all the protein coding genes have these signatures, but we were also finding thousands of other regions that were not, they were not annotated in the genome, but had these signatures as well. And, and so, um, you know, Eric and I were talking about it and he said, well, let's, this sounds, this seems really interesting. Don't know what it is, but we should probably focus on this and figure it out. And, um, you know, that's basically, you know, from that point on, I was hooked and this became all I do and all I think about, right? Which, you know, these turned out to be not coding regions and, you know, what we now call link RNAs and, and have really formed the basis of, of everything I think about uh, since then. So, you know, it was, if you will, sort of an unintended um, uh, area for me, but really has um, uh, allowed me to explore what, what, what has turned out to be even far more interesting uh, biology and mechanisms uh, of uh, in, in, in human biology than I would have anticipated. So obviously you've carried this interest over to your lab in Caltech and there you're still looking at non-coding RNAs, but you've divided your high level goal of understanding how non-coding RNA, specifically link RNA impacts gene expression into three components. Could you introduce these components and you know walk through your ongoing research in each? Sure. Um, so um, I guess I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly which three components, uh, although I guess when I started, I, guess I said link, how link RNAs shape 3D organization to regulate gene expression, um, which I assume is what you mean by the three components. Um, yeah, so you know, to sort of take a step back in sort of the, the trajectory for a moment, you know, when I was a graduate student, right, um, uh, I focused a lot on defining what these link RNAs are. And, characterizing their functional role in, in cells. And in particular, trying to understand, do these RNAs, these at the time unannotated regions of the genome that don't code for proteins, actually have important functional roles. And we found thousands of these link RNAs that, sh that, that and showed that they play really important functions uh, in many different biological processes. And we're in many ways, sort of central to um, uh, the functional regulation in, in, in a cell. Uh, and so when I started my lab, uh, what I really wanted to answer was, in, in, in a way, a very simple question. And that is, um, you know, why utilize a link RNA uh, rather than a protein, for example, to control certain processes? Um, or put another way, you know, what are the unique features of a link RNA that, a, that distinguishes it in terms of what it can do from what a protein can do? Um, right? Is it basically just another molecule that does the exact redundant thing, or is there something unique about it? And so, um, so that's really what, we, what we've set out to do. And um, you know, we began to tackle this question. Uh, and, and the way that we tackled this question was really to try to really dissect how, how a link RNA can work and how it can actually control uh, gene expression uh, yeah, yeah, through these different processes. And, and so, um, you know, Without going into too much detail, what we found, um, you know, early on uh, by focusing on a specific link RNA called Exist, which is involved in controlling X chromosome inactivation, is that the way that link, that in this case the Exist link RNA, um, but we now know is more general beyond Exist, the way that this that these link RNAs can can uh, localize their target sites and regulate gene expression of their targets is quite distinct from the way a protein would do it. So at the time we thought, you know, and let's let's talk about exist specifically. Exist is involved in X inactivation, so it localizes specifically on the X chromosome. No one really understood how. The prevailing assumption by ourselves in the field, as well, was that there were some um, 
uh, initiation sites on the X chromosome or seed sequences that exist can localize to and spread from. And in fact, you know, there are reasons to think that that, that might be the case. That's how most, uh, certainly most proteins or all proteins pretty much work. Um, and there are even some examples in the context of flies that suggested that that would, that may be the case. Um, and what we were surprised to find when we actually started exploring this was that that wasn't the case, right? There aren't special sequences on the X chromosome that exist localizes to, but rather what we found was that what drives specificity of exist to the X chromosome is actually uh, 3D structure. That is how the X chromosome, the DNA of the X chromosome is packaged inside the nucleus. And you know, just to take a slight detour for those who may not um, uh, know much about 3D structure, you know, um, the DNA, it, you know, the, if, you, if you were to take the entire human genome sequence, the DNA um, that's contained in the nucleus of every single one of our cells and stretch it out end to end, right? The, the you know, DNA sequence would, would measure about two meters, okay, or about seven feet or so uh, in length, right? And that has to be packaged into every, into this sort of tiny nucleus of every single cell. And so there's um, enormous levels of packaging and compression that go on to actually ensure that not only that this can actually um, be packaged inside the nucleus itself, but equally important um, is that it can be accessed um, in the correct ways to enable to be decoded, um, right? Because if you were just packaging DNA, right, that's a very different challenge than if you're trying to package it, but with the ability to access it as needed, right? And so, um, and so there's a whole a whole bunch of regulation that goes into how to package DNA and how to decode it, and and and, and um, but the the, what, what the most important aspect for this is that um, the structure of how DNA is laid out in this 3D packaging is not random. So, so um, certain regions of DNA tend to interact with other regions of DNA and exclude, uh, you know, you, you know, other, other, you know, other regions altogether. And so you have this non-random structure of how DNA gets laid out that uh, occurs within inside the nucleus of each cell um, that play critical roles. We can talk more about later, um, but you know, um, with that detour aside, what we found is, is that the, that how exist actually achieves specificity to one and only one X chromosome in females, uh, where it's, where it's responsible for silencing one and only one chromosome to achieve dosage balance between males and females is by exploiting this non-random, uh, uh, packaging of DNA. And, and that was quite unique because at the time, um, you know, that had never been that had never been a mechanism that had been shown before. And uh, in, in fact, to be perfectly frank, we actually assumed it was, there were other technical explanations for why we were seeing this and spent a lot of time actually trying to convince ourselves that this was actually meaningful. Um, but one of the things that you know, we found is, is that we could actually reprogram, if you will, where exist localizes, um, you know, both on the X chromosome, but also on, on non X chromosomes, or what are called autosomes, simply by changing where this gene gets expressed. And what's remarkable about it is, you know, if you put it somewhere else, it will localize at that new place following the same exact three dimensional principles. And so there's nothing special about the X chromosome other than where it is. And, and so, um, you know, that sort of set us on this sort of whole new direction in terms of thinking about the question I posed at the beginning, which is what is unique about link RNAs? And you know, this aspect of this three-dimensional spatial search through, through, through on, a, on a chromosome through the nucleus is something that is actually quite unique to a non-coding RNA. It's something that, that proteins can't do. It's something DNA can't do. And it started to actually you know, set us on this trajectory of thinking about, you know, um, of, of, of this idea of sort of 3D organization as sort of sort of a unique and critical aspect of how RNAs work and of how they can um, achieve sort of unique regulatory roles inside inside the nucleus. Um, and you know, I'd be happy to talk more about why that is later because we can extrapolate on this for a long time. But um, going to the sort of second part of this question, which is sort of how you know now that they can sort of get to these specific sites by utilizing their, their, their position in the nucleus. Um, we were able to uncover also mechanisms of how these RNAs can recruit different types of regulatory proteins to these very specific sites, right? Like once you can achieve specificity, you can actually recruit 
different types of, you can scaffold whole complexes of regulatory proteins, not just one factor, but dozens of factors and, and get them to pre precisely the right place inside the nucleus to control gene expression only at those locations and not at other locations throughout, throughout the nucleus, right? And, um, and, and sort of that set us up into this, this very simple picture, but very powerful picture of sort of RNAs as these um, specificity factors, these, these molecules that can sort of direct traffic, if you will, direct proteins to the right place to achieve the right concentrations at the right targets while simultaneously excluding um, uh, and, and preventing um, uh, incorrect uh, uh, regulation of other targets around in, in the nucleus that, that exist. And so um, we've been building on sort of those observations to, to understand more generally sort of how um, important RNA is as a class in sort of shaping, explo exploiting, shaping, and regulating the architecture of the nucleus and how these different types of structural changes that occur in the nucleus actually translate into um, uh, critical uh, uh, regulatory programs. So obviously the ability of link RNA to create spatial compartments of DNA and regulate gene expression, that has huge implications. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, one thing I wanted to dive into before we got into the potential applications of your work was, you know, this was an emerging field. All the tools that you needed to kind of study this space didn't exist when you set out. And so your lab actually created a few different tools for studying RNA. Can right. you give us a quick overview of these tools and you know how they're they've been able to progress the field? Sure. Um, yeah. So you know, as you pointed out, you know, one of the big challenges actually in tackling many of these and uncovering many of these principles was developing approaches that allowed us to look at them for the first time. You know, we've had you know decades of of, of work that went into how to characterize proteins and how to look you know map proteins onto DNA and how to even for that matter make genetic perturbations that disrupt proteins, right? Um, uh, but once you start thinking about non-coding RNAs, uh, it, it poses its own technical challenges that, frankly, we hadn't really thought about before as a field. And so, um, so, so as you pointed out, yeah, my lab, you know, one of the things that we do is we develop new technologies that are critical for allowing us to advance these questions. And, you know, over the years, we've developed actually uh, numerous different approaches, um, uh, for example, for studying RNA protein interactions, uh, RNA DNA localization. Uh, in fact, one of the first methods that we developed uh, back in 2013 uh, is a method we call uh, RAP or RNA antisense purification, which is actually the reason we were able to characterize how it exists localizes and we're able to uncover that 3D localization property. Um, and you know, that method um, basically uh, works very much analogously to uh, CHIP, uh, chromatin precipitation that I, that I described earlier, right? Which is this method that allows you to pull down a specific protein and map where on DNA it's bound. Um, but where, you know, in the case of chip, you're pulling down a protein, you, have a, you use an antibody and you, you purify the DNA that's crossing to it. Um, obviously you can't do that for RNA. And so in the case of RAP, what we, what we did is we uh, developed um, a parallel strategy that allowed us to design um, antisense oligos that uh, are quite long, so they can form very strong hybrids with our RNA of interest. And then we can purify those hybrids using um, at the time it was biotin stripped avidin, but there are other variations of it since, um, but with some handle that allows us to purify that specific complex, you know, wash away anything that, that is not specific um, or, you know, that, that forms, you know, poorly with, uh, poor, you know, not very strong hybrids with, with our probes of interest and then sequence the DNA that associates with it. You know, it seems trivial and certainly in hindsight, but even, you know, it seems like maybe it's a trivial adaptation of chip, but, but actually, you know, there are many unique challenges to working with RNA and, and actually getting that to work, you know, has been incredibly valuable um, uh, for the field. It allowed us to uncover a lot of what we do, but I think more generally for the field, um, uh, you know, there are other adaptations of RAP as well, uh, methods, for example, by Howard Chang's lab uh, called CHIRP, which is a very similar concept that, um, that you know, that the, these approaches have basically become the standard uh, for how to map uh, RNA uh, localization on DNA. Now, um, you know, having done done that, one you know one of the things that we were able to do is actually adapt that similar purification strategy to try to understand how to really understand what the molecular complex that an RNA forms is, and, and you know, in particular, sort of you know, think about sort of the RNA protein assembly 
that a link RNA can can generate, and um, that that also you know is quite challenging for for many technical reasons. One of which is the fact that RNA um, you know is notoriously sticky. What I mean by that is is that there are many proteins that will bind to RNA um, that don't necessarily occur inside a cell, but happen when you break open the cell, and then all of a sudden you have all these free RNA binding proteins, including many that are very abundant. Right, you know, ribosomal proteins bind to RNA. They're obviously far more abundant than many other more specific RNA binding proteins. And now you actually have to deal with the fact that they can form non-specific associations in solution. And that has actually been a problem that may seem trivial, but actually had plagued uh, the RNA field for decades. Um, this question of how do you separate out interactions that really are occurring in vivo in a cell from those that simply reflect sort of these in vitro associations. Um, and, you know, a really classic example of this is um, this, at least in the RNA field, a very famous study by Joan Stites um, at Yale in her lab uh, back in, I want to say, the early 90s, where they showed that, you know, if you take two cells, one of which expresses the RNA, one of which expresses the protein, um, and you um, sort of, you know, mix it together, purify out the protein, right, you get very strong interactions between the RNA and protein, even though they obviously couldn't have occurred inside a cell because they're not even present in the same cell. And, and, and that really um, uh, highlighted many of the challenges, I think, that have, you know, plagued this, this field. And so, you know, using EXIST as an example, um, you know, EXIST was first identified genetically back in, in the early 90s, in 1991, um, you know, by Hunt Willard, Neil Brockdorf and others. Carolyn Brown, et cetera. And one of the obvious first questions is, okay, here's this critical gene that seems to be associated with X inactivation, right? It's only expressed on the inactive X chromosome in females. You know, it may hold the sort of key to uncovering this developmental mis this critical developmental mystery. Um, but you know, how? And it, it's not that the idea of purifying the RNA and trying to mass spec or otherwise characterize the protein complex associated with it is a new one. Uh, in fact, uh, several groups have started doing that in the early 90s, right? But they were unable to actually make a whole lot of progress because of the technical challenges that, that I was describing. So one of the first things that we did once we had this method, this RNA antisense purification method, was that we adapted it to actually utilize um, a, a few critical features of uh, RNA biochemistry, RNA protein biochemistry that had been developed over the years. And, and most importantly, you know, sort of adapting this, this concept um, uh, that was originally came from a, um, this method called CLIP uh, from Bob Darnell and others, where you can use UV light to form these covalent crosslinks between directly interacting RNAs and proteins. And because they, in, in cells, and because they form these covalent interactions, what you can then do is you can um, purify what you want in denaturing conditions that disrupt everything else. They basically make it such that you know, an RNA and protein interaction cannot form. And if they existed but weren't cross-linked, they would dissociate because you would change, you would basically break up all the structure. Um, and, uh, you know, there are several keys to making that work. Most importantly, the ability to actually form uh, a hybrid that's strong enough to withstand that, uh, DNA, those denaturing conditions. Um, but, you know, making a long story short, we were able to do that. And that allowed us to sort of purify individual RNAs and, and get very high sensitivity and most importantly, high specificity for these in vivo complexes. And so, you know, applying this to exist, you know, for the first time, you know, we were able to actually uncover the critical mechanism by which exist actually silences transcription on the X chromosome, which had been a, you know, a long standing mystery for almost 25 years at that point. Um, uh, and it turned out to be incredibly interesting for many reasons we can talk about later. Um, but, you know, in addition to sort of our ability to use it for exist, it, you know, the field has now used it for many different, studying many different link RNAs, you know, from, uh, um, you know, NORAD, which is a link RNA involved in uh, cytoplasmic aggregation, uh, a translational control uh, to, um, uh, I, you know, I can't even probably enumerate them on MALT1, which is involved in sort of localization of splicing factors and, and others. And so um, most recently, actually, you know, these methods like our RAPMS methods were actually used by at least four, three or four different groups to actually characterize um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. In particular, right, as 
as you may know, right, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. And so when it infects your cells, its genome is made out of RNA. So you basically, it basically deposits this RNA, this RNA genome inside a human cell. And, and, and there are many um, human protein factors that are critical for enabling it to replicate itself and propagate. And so uh, one of the things that uh, several groups actually have done um, over the last year and a half is actually use our rapid mass methods to actually purify the SARS-CoV-2 viral genome and characterize what proteins are bound, what human proteins are bound to it to try to understand precisely how it actually hijacks human uh, proteins to actually control its propagation. Uh, and, and those have been incredibly informative. Uh, there have been a lot of really beautiful insights that came out of that. Um, for me personally, I, I just was, I, I find it incredibly mar remarkable how consistent the results have been across these different groups, which is, you know, as someone who we spent a lot of time thinking about the technical aspects here, it's very exciting in its own right, but uh, certainly um, it was nice to see sort of its application um, even in, in, in areas that we hadn't anticipated, but which obviously have important implications in, in human health. Um, you know, we, we similarly have developed other sort of orthogonal approaches to, for example, purifying an individual RNA uh, to, cap, to, 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 to study what proteins it binds to, uh, where we developed some covalent purification strategies to purify individual proteins and understand where on RNA they bind to. Um, and this has been really important for understanding sort of specific sequences and structures in RNAs that can act to recruit proteins or to actually scaffold um, uh, uh, different proteins in, in, in different ways. Um, but actually one of the things that has turned out to be incredibly valuable about these approaches as well, um, you know, similarly, is that uh, we've been able to actually apply these in the context of viral infection, SARS-CoV-2 viral infection, to understand also how um, the various different viral proteins can actually disrupt, um, you know, bind to and disrupt critical human uh, uh, processes, uh, host processes. Uh, so for example, you know, we, we were able to uncover, you know, several um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins that are important for antagonizing um, the ribosome, so to prevent post mRNA translation, to, to antagonize mRNA splicing by competing for um, uh, binding between the U1 snRNA and nascent pre-mRNAs of human mRNAs, uh, as well as uh, proteins that can antagonize uh, protein trafficking through the endoplasmic reticulum. And so once again, you know, uh, not really what we anticipated uh, when we developed these methods, but obviously uh, still really fascinating. Um, uh, um, for being able to characterize some of these um, pathogenic me path mechanisms of pathogenesis, the path of virulence <laughs> of these of these viruses. Um, so, you know, moving, you know, sort of from the RNA protein space, you know, one, one of the other, you know, critical, uh, I would say methodological toolkits that we've developed in the lab uh, actually relates to the ability to understand space and, and how molecules are, are spatially arranged. And, I think that's generally been a much harder problem. You know, looking at pairwise interactions of how a given RNA interacts with a protein is hard. There are some technical challenges, but it's sort of a more traditional way that we think about molecular biology and, 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 and interactions. But once we start thinking a lot about this idea that RNA can shape through the organization, that there are preferential um, topologies of chromosomes that are important for controlling how these molecules behave and how they control expression, what we started to realize is that we needed sort of new paradigms that allow us to look at molecular interactions, not as individual uh, events, but rather as sort of spatial three-dimensional objects and, 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 and interactions. And so um, uh, a few years back, um, you know, we developed a, a method we call Sprite, but ba it basically is an approach that allows us to generate um, sort of higher order 3D uh, maps of, of DNA RNA and DNA, and, and most recently protein DNA, RNA DNA uh, interactions in uh, in the nucleus, and, and allows us to sort of um, not just understand what molecules interact with each other, but but really what the higher order spatial arrangement of these molecules are. Um, and you know there are a lot of really cool things that we've been able to, to learn from this, which um, also I hadn't fully anticipated when we started. Um, but you know even beyond link RNAs, actually, and we can talk more about the link RNA stuff in a moment. But even beyond link RNAs what we've been able to uncover once we had these genome-wide 3D maps of the nucleus um, is that, that the nucleus is actually organized into these 
critical structural hubs um, and it's such that, you know, for, for example, such that actively transcribed genes tend to be spatially organized uh, relative to each other. Uh, and that's true across chromosomes. So you have an active gene on, you know, chromosome 19, an active gene on chromosome seven. Uh, don't quote me on the exact chromosomes. I, I'm making up the exact, I'm making up the names for a moment, but, but if you have a active, these active genes on different chromosomes, they actually are spatially organized in the nucleus around these um, uh, protein RNA bodies that contain um, sort of high concentrations of different transcription and mRNA processing factors that are important for um, uh, processing the RNA that's made from those from those genes. And this is actually not just true for Paul II transcripts and, and mRNAs and, and splicing, but actually if you start looking across the entire spectrum, you actually find similar types of processing bodies and DNA organization around these processing bodies pretty much across all classes of of specialized RNA processing. And that includes, as a, the, the example I should have told you about a moment ago, you know, mRNAs and, and you know, Paul II transcripts, but it also includes um, you know, the classic example of ribosomes and Paul I transcripts around the nucleolus, as well as you know, histone mRNAs around these specialized bodies um, uh, that contain um, uh, the processing factors required for you know, reprime cleavage and non polydental reprime cleavage and processing, non polydentalytic processing of histone mRNAs, uh, you know, processing organization for snRNAs, uh, which are the small nuclear RNAs and the splicing. And so, this idea of sort of these spatial hubs of co transcriptional organization um, really seems to be this sort of shared feature of genome organization that I think, you know, we haven't fully appreciated. Um, uh, uh, previously, and, and it really suggests, at least to me, this is still to be tested, but that there are, you know, the, these the, these important sort of co-transcriptional kinetics um, uh, uh, roles of, of spatial organization that are important for ensuring sort of the, the efficiency of, of, of RNA processing uh, after transcription of each of these individual uh, classes of genes. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk more about the link RNA specific aspect of this, but but really, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for a moment and just say, so, you know, having these sort of this toolkit really has allowed us to start exploring many of these questions, um, you know, both in their in their specific examples, but also uh, more recently in their in their generality, right? And um, I started off by telling you that we had uncovered that mechanism for exist um, back in 2013, this 3D organization principle, but by using Sprite, for example, we've been able to actually show that you know, many hundreds of link RNAs, in fact, you know, we've been able to identify more than 600 link RNAs that actually form, um, that, that exploit three-dimensional structure shape and shape three-dimensional structure to form these high concentration territories throughout the nucleus. So it's not really an exception. It's actually seems like it may be the rule in many ways. Um, uh, and being able to have these genome-wide pictures actually allows us to start to explore that uh, more globally. Awesome, so we've covered it bunch of different topics and we want to quickly recap a couple of important points that you've mentioned as we dive into this next section where is where I think things start to get really interesting what are the potential applications for these technologies but you know, your lab you know first started with the correlation that exists to um, action silencing and then through these tools you developed you were able to show you know what were the RNA protein complexes involved in this process how does that mechanism of action work and then beyond that, start to show the spatial organization of DNA and nucleus and that similar genes were spatially located uh, close to each other in close proximity to each other. Um, and then further, you know, able to extrapolate beyond exists to show there are a broader set of link RNAs that are involved in um, gene regulation. So those are kind of the high level points that I think are really important, but now we'd love to have you explain. So you've made all of these incredible discoveries. You know, what are the applications of these discoveries? Right, right. Why are they important? And what do you hope that people, yourself or other people will be able to do with them moving forward? Yeah, um, so uh, all, all great questions. Um, so um, yeah, let me, uh, <laughs> just structure my thoughts for a moment because there are many answers to your question, actually. Um, you know, I think that in many ways, um, you know, the, the key to sort of 
application of many different areas in biology is really our understanding of sort of the basic mechanisms by which uh, normal biology utilizes different molecules to actually achieve regulation. And so, you know, the way I think about it th th is that, you know, many of these discoveries, there, there, there are many, many implications and applications of these different discoveries, and they range, they, you know, and I'm going to choose my words carefully here, because I, I don't want to call it, they range from the mundane to the highly complicated, because that's a, 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 a more pejorative thing that I need to say, but um, I guess they range from the more traditional applications to sort of the more creative and, 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 and potentially very distinct approaches for thinking about um, uh, biological control and, and um, biological modulation. Um, and so maybe we, we can start with the more traditional, and, and that is that, you know, our ability to understand how many of these different RNAs control gene expression. So for example, our, the fact that we've been able to uncover the mechanism of how exists silences the X chromosome, right? And in, in particular, uh, the way that exists silences the X chromosome is by binding to this RNA binding protein called SHARP, which is the SMART and HDAC associated repressor protein. SHARP, as the name implies, binds to SMART and HDAC3. HDAC3 is a histone deacetylase complex. Uh, of which a class one HDAC, uh, um, of which there are many drugs that, for example, uh, can inhibit its activity. Many, including many FDA approved drugs for other purposes, that can, you know, inhibit the histone deacetylase activity. And so, once you understand sort of the, the the fundamental components that are involved in this process, one can think about more traditional strategies of can we utilize or develop drugs, small molecules that can, for example, disrupt the enzymatic activity of this complex and therefore change the expression, the ability for it to silence transcription. Now, why are things like that uh, of interest? Well, you know, um, uh, exist is a very important, X inactivation is a very important developmental process, right? And that's because, you know, as a male, I have one X chromosome, as a, the females have two X chromosomes, but unlike the Y chromosome, which has very few important genes, the, the few exceptions are the ones that actually code for sex. The X chromosome actually has hundreds of, of, of critically important genes, very few of which have anything to do with sex. And so, you know, if we didn't, you know, if we were just walking around with this asymmetry in our X chromosomes, and you actually have a dosage problem uh, for many critical uh, proteins that are present, uh, critical genes that are present on the X chromosome. And so evolutionarily, um, uh, basically every, every organism that has sex chromosomes has figured out a way to achieve dosage balance between males and females. In the case of, of humans or placental mammals, um, the way that we do it is through X inactivation. That means that we silence one of the two X chromosomes in females. There are other strategies, you know, flies, you know, activate the, the double the dosage expression of the male X chromosome, right? Uh, you know, C. elegans, worms, um, basically express half the copy number of each X chromosome in females. Uh, so, but, you know, in, in, in humans, we, we do it by silencing one of the two X chromosomes. Um, now that certainly works from the point of view of, of dosage balance, but where it becomes problematic is that, um, you know, when you think about genetic diseases, right? Most genetic diseases are caused by um, homozygous uh, loss of function of critical, of critical genes. Um, most genes are um, what we would what we would call haplosufficient, meaning if I have a mutation that knocks out, that basically causes a loss of function in in, in 50%, in, in basically my one of my two crumb, my, my two copies, you'll be fine, right? This is why they tend to be recessive, right? Um, but if you have a mutation that occurs on the X chromosome, uh, you don't have another copy to compensate for it, uh, and that's actually why there are these preferential diseases that only affect male, that, that primarily affect males, things like fragile X syndrome and the like, is because you know all you need is to inherit one bad copy and you basically have um, this disorder. Um, and so traditionally, you know, when you, you know, when you learn basic genetics, Punnett squares in high school and early college, whatever, you know, we tend to talk about sex chromosomes as uh, predominantly. Um, uh, you know, where, where you, you'd have what would appear to be a dominant effect only in males because of this um, uh, what, hemizygosity, right? The presence of only one chromosome. But it turns out that actually there are a whole bunch of different diseases that actually are X-linked that primarily affect girls. And, and the reason for this is actually um, 
uh, maybe less simple to explain than the, the male case, but, 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 but maybe for simplicity, you can think about it this way. Um, if you had a complete loss of function of a, of a critical gene on the X chromosome, uh, such as in males, uh, that would be developmentally really problematic, such, so much so that to the point that you would never see that, that, that boy born. Because, for example, you have a mutation of loss of function of MECP2, uh, for example, which is a critical um, DNA methylation protein. Um, that's so critical for development that, that, that basically those males will, will basically die before you can realize it. So they'll never be born. So you don't have, you know, you don't have boys walking around with an MECP2 deletion, okay, for the most part. Um, but on the other hand, if a girl gets one mutation in a critical excellent gene like MECP2, um, you know, they still have their other copies. So developmentally speaking, they, 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 they can still, they're still born. They still, they can still pass that, if you will, selection threshold. But, um, but because X activation will randomly silence one of the two X chromosomes, that means that approximately 50% of all the cells in their body will have no expression of this protein, whereas 50, the other 50% will have normal expression of it. So it's, it's enough that they'll, that they'll survive, but it also um, is still quite detrimental to the point that they actually are born with very severe um, uh, intellectual disabilities and motor defects and um, other sort of uh, physical manifestations of, of these diseases. In the case of MECP2 in particular, you know, this, this leads to a disease called Brett syndrome, which, uh, you know, um, with, with very few exceptions that are interesting in their own right, almost exclusively affects girls for this exact reason. There are others along this, this spectrum as well. Um, uh, you know, similar disease that's referred to as CDKL5 syndrome uh, is caused by the same hemizygous, uh, heterozygous mutation of CDKL5, um, uh, where you have effectually, effectively X inactivation masking functional copy. And, 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 and there are others. And, and in addition to sort of genetic diseases, there are also a lot of, for example, tumor suppressor genes on X chromosomes, on the X chromosome, uh, for example, WTX, which is a, a critical uh, a gene involved in Wilms tumor. Uh, it's, Wilms tumor is a pediatric kidney tumor, fairly you know, uh, evenly distributed in terms of you know, uh, boys and girls in terms of who will get it. In the case of uh, males, the reason they get it um, is because you know, the traditional two hit hypothesis for tumor suppressor genes would argue that you need to accumulate you know, two mutations to take out a tumor suppressor gene, and that takes time. In the case of Wilms, in w, the case of WTX, you know, boys only need to accumulate one because there's only one copy of it. And in the case of girls, you only need to accumulate one because you have X inactivation to take out the other copy. Um, same is true for other tumor suppressor genes, ATRX, and uh, probably enumerate a whole bunch of others, just not off the top of my head. But, you know, these are um, not uncommon, for example, in glioblastomas. Uh, same idea, right? You know, X inactivation effectively acts to, you um, accelerate, if you will, sort of loss of function of these critical tumor suppressor genes. And so you can imagine that, you know, a, one way to, to, to think about therapeutics for many of these genetic diseases, these excellent genetic diseases, is by exploiting the fact that, you know, unlike many other cases, right, these girls actually encode a functional copy of gene, the important gene in their genome, right? It's not that we need to deliver the gene. It's not that that gene you know, is, is broken and therefore we need to get a functional copy. And they have a functional copy. It's just that it's masked by this process of X inactivation. So, you know, one can, can think about this idea that if we understand how um, this gene gets silenced, therefore not expressed, uh, their functional copy gets, is not expressed, you know, we can actually develop or utilize in this case, small molecules that can block that enzymatic activity to promote expression of their functional copy and therefore potentially sort of um, treat the underlying genetic root cause of these diseases. And, and there's actually quite a lot of evidence from animal models um, that reactivation of these, uh, um, these causal genes actually does have, uh, or, or, or seems to, will, will likely have an, a, a valuable therapeutic uh, potential in, 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 in these uh, symptoms. Thank you. Uh, diseases. So, you know, that's, I would say, a more traditional application of like, what can we learn and therefore understand how to do this? And I think even beyond the X chromosome, there are, you know, you can extrapolate that to many others, right? Like, there are many different diseases that are caused by parent of origin genomic imprinting, right? The fact that, um, you think about Angelman syndrome, pretty willy syndrome, right? The fact that you have a mutation inherited from your father or from your mother, because you have these critical alleles that are 
um, only express monoallelically from either the mom or dad. So it's the same exact principle, right? Which is, I mean, the mechanism of silence is fundamentally different, but the same principle, which is all I need is one mutation. I have a functional copy. It's just masked by this um, uh, silencing process. And so once again, you know, in the case of, of imprinting in, in those cases, um, those are also controlled actually by link RNAs uh, for the reasons, same reasons why they are for in the case of exist, different RNAs, but same idea. Understanding how they work and how they silence means that once again, you can think about these strategies to sort of unlock the functional copy and, and treat the underlying root cause of, of these different diseases. So, you know, those are what I think of as sort of these tradition, more traditional strategies, right? Like identify sort of genetic cause, um, understand how, you know, an, an RNA complex is, is important for controlling it and target that complex, understand, you know, what that complex is and, and to either develop drugs or utilize existing drugs that can target that complex to actually uh, modulate its activity. And then I think that one can think about sort of, if you will, more non-traditional um, uh, uh, strategies for therapeutics. And, and in particular, you know, one of the things that, that has gotten me very excited is um, you know, this, 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 this observation, this discovery that I alluded to earlier, which is that, you know, um, using our genome-wide structure maps, what we've been able to uncover is many hundreds of different link RNAs that can actually form these um, high concentration spatial compartments, the nucleus, that are critical for guiding different regulatory proteins to these very specific places in the nucleus. In fact, what's quite remarkable is if you actually look at um, sort of this, this integrative picture, the vast majority of the nucleus is demarcated by one of these high concentration RNA compartments, which means that um, in a way these RNAs, that, that, well, there, there are two things about this. One is that, you know, that in a way, this is how the, the cell, the nucleus creates these high concentration spatial compartments of, 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 pro, of regulatory proteins at specific target sites. Um, and can do so across the genome, across the nucleus. But also what that means is, is that this provides a platform for thinking about and for sort of directing or addressing molecules to specific locations, right? And so, you know, one thing you can imagine is that if biology is utilizing these RNAs as platforms to provide specificity to otherwise ubiquitous regulatory factors, you know, why can't we think about using these RNAs as platforms for providing specificity to ubiquitous uh, therapeutic modalities, whether it's, you know, expressing or, or localizing regulators that specifically, you know, upregulate or downregulate uh, a transcription, or even uh, for guiding and targeting small molecules or drugs that, you know, uh, rather than sort of in, uh, affecting every gene or every protein of a class. Let's take an HDAC inhibitor for a moment. Rather than, you know, shutting down all histone deacetylases across the entire nucleus, across every cell type, which, you know, is tolerated. It's certainly not pleasant and it creates other problems, right? You might be willing to do it in extreme cases, but you probably don't want to treat, you know, uh, everything that way. Um, and obviously, with, you know, there are other drugs where you would never even use it therapeutically. Like, a polymerase inhibitor, right? Like you would never treat a human with an RNA pol 2 inhibitor because that would be toxic. But if you can imagine delivering these types of warheads, if you will, at very low overall concentrations, but in ways that would achieve very high targeted concentrations so that they can only affect these sort of local activities by exploiting sort of these zip codes, these, these molecules that act to sort of concentrate and localize regulatory factors, you can imagine creating a, a sort of a programmable uh, uh, sort of molecular, um, a, a programmable regulatory framework um, that can be, I think, potentially exploited uh, very broadly uh, for thinking about many different types of uh, genetic diseases uh, and regulatory paradigms. So essentially what you're describing is a new mechanism for impacting Kind of the simple dogma of you know what proteins are actually being expressed, um, right? You know, and, and 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 the the way that I think about it is that we now know, and and there are many many good examples of the fact that if you look at where proteins are in the cell, they're not uniform, they're not random, right? They're highly compartmentalized. Um, what we don't really know, and what we didn't really understand, is how 
right? Because intrinsically, most proteins don't have spatial information. Uh, and there's a reason for that, the reason, especially in the nucleus, the, you know, in how they engage with um, the critical, you know, components in the nucleus, which is where sort of, if you will, decisions get made about what gets transcribed. Um, and the reason for that is simple, which is that proteins get made in the cytoplasm on ribosomes. So they have to get re-imported into the nucleus, search through the entire nuclear volume to find their targets. So even if they have regions they have specificity for, through, for example, uh, specific DNA binding domains, right, they still have to diffuse and search, right? And the contrast to RNA is that sort of because RNA can be made in the nucleus and can stay in the nucleus and it can act immediately upon transcription within the nucleus, it means it can form these sort of high concentration territories that can act, if you will, as, as seeds that sort of direct traffic, that direct protein to these, um, uh, to these different regions. And so, um, you know, because of that, I, I would say sort of unique feature of RNA, for it, it provides that ability to start thinking about, um, you know, uh, how do we direct traffic? How do we use these to direct, direct our own traffic, right? And if we can sort of um, uh, use that exact same principle to sort of get things to the right place or, or I should say to the places we want rather than the places we don't want uh, within, 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 within the cell nucleus. Yeah. So come on, using this insight, there's many different drug platforms that one can imagine. One that you describe is conjugating a small molecule, you know, a DNA polymerase inhibitor to an RNA, which would then localize that small molecule to a specific compartment within the nucleus and only impact certain genes. So this is another mechanism of impacting expression. You know, right. there are some other things that we're also doing with, you know, siRNA or RNA sure. activation and mRNA. How would this approach differ from some of these other things? We're right. Doing? Well, well, firstly, I mean, I, I should, you know, start by just saying, you know, um, what I'm describing is sort of a theoretical framework, certainly not one that's, um, you know, I, I certainly don't mean to imply the specificity of it because we've certainly never directed any you know, specific molecules to a specific place using conjugated molecules. Um, there are other ways to imagine doing that that have nothing to do with small molecules. You can do it genetically. And we've done that with, for example, you know, synthetic, uh, you know, binding sites on proteins and RNA. Um, but in, so in theory, it, it should be possible to do that, but there are many permutations of that to actually achieve similar uh, effects. Now, I mean, how would something like this be different fundamentally from something like, you know, mRNA delivery or siRNAs? Um, you know, so in the case of, you know, mRNA delivery, what you're really doing is not changing the underlying transcription of of a gene, what you're trying to do is, is basically add in a new message. So if you have, uh, so imagine for a moment, let's talk um, ALS, okay? Uh, you know, the most common form of ALS, genetic form of ALS is a mutation, repeat expansion in a gene called CNNR72. Um, this is a, uh, if you will, dominant gain of function mutation, right? So, you know, one of the two alleles gets this repeat expansion and that's what leads to ALS mRNA delivery won't help you. Why? Because, because this is a mutation that actually is, is dominant. So it's not like you can put in a missing piece. In this case, uh, what you need to be able to do is turn off the bad piece, right? And there are many examples like that, by the way. Um, I just use that because that's the first one that comes to mind. But, but um, um, so mRNAs are good for replacing things that don't currently exist. Like as in, you know, you have a loss of function of tumor suppressor gene, can I put it back in? Um, you have loss of function of your protein, can I put it back in? Doesn't work for, you know, turning things off that are sort of aberrantly expressed. For example, oncogenes, right? You have high levels of MYC, putting an mRNA, it's not gonna help you, right? Um, now, uh, there may be other advantages too, but that was sort of at a very simple level. Uh, in terms of RNAi, um, once again, RNAi, is, you know, would be more about targeting sort of a message. Um, uh, and it would have its own limit, you know, it would have certainly its own strengths, but its own limitations. In the case of RNAi, you can sort of degrade certain transcripts that, um, and therefore reduce protein levels of certain things. That also, of course, requires that, it doesn't happen in the nucleus, it happens in the cytoplasm, so it won't affect transcription, it won't affect DNA, um, but it also requires that whatever you're targeting um, uh, is, uh, is basically because of an overproduction of protein. So let's use the ALS example uh, again, Right, um, you know, 
it probably would be pretty impermeable to RNAi because for the most part, this repeat expansion RNA is predominantly localized in the nucleus. Um, uh, and therefore sort of RNAi probably wouldn't work very effectively. And, you know, conversely, you know, it wouldn't work in the other examples, which would be all of the ones that, that, where you'd want to add in new functions, right? Um, so I think that those paradigms tend to work in terms of modulating just the levels of control of an individual protein, less about sort of the, you know, a lot of the holistic properties that are occurring in terms of how uh, either it's individual genes or importantly, sets of genes get affected. So, so uh, for example, you know, most diseases are not even monogenic, right? Most are more complex where there's not one gene, but many genes that are, that are involved in regulation or there are multiple factors that are critical. Um, you know, those are strategies where you can imagine having access to, if you will, neighborhoods, right? Uh, not to a single gene, let's talk imprinting gene, not to a single gene in an imprinting cluster, but to the dozen or so genes that are present within the imprinting cluster, right? Uh, and being able to modulate the activity of not one, but all. Um, you know, uh, those are the kinds of activities that, that, you know, would obviously be very beneficial in this, in this particular type of context. Um, I would add, you know, one of the big challenges, obviously, with all of those RNA-based strategies is delivery. Um, you know, one, you know, uh, obviously, you know, everything I'm talking about is theoretical, but in practice, you know, the idea of delivering siRNAs has been a dream for, you know, what, a decade and a half, maybe almost two decades now. And in theory, you know, it should solve a lot of problems. In practice, you know, it's challenging. Um, uh, same for mRNA delivery. You know, uh, you know, in theory, Moderna was going to cure the world. Um, they've done great, but, you know, they've had to focus very specifically on certain types of applications specifically because delivery is a real challenge. And, you know, that, that, that's not meant as a criticism. It's just a reality is I think that, you know, uh, if one is thinking about, you know, modular programmable platforms, I think, you know, you can't really get away from thinking about the delivery challenge. And I think that one of the nice things about um, trying to reframe many of these, uh, many of these um, paradigms into sort of small molecule based strategies is that we know that not all small molecules, but that there's long history of the ability to get to actually deliver small molecules robustly into a variety of different tissues and tissue types that make it very more, much more accessible and broader acting uh, platform than, than for example, uh, RNA delivery, whether it's RNAi or mRNA or even for that matter, CRISPR, um, uh, all of which I have a lot of hope will make huge impacts. Um, uh, but I, I do think that those will limit a lot of the, the true generality of these strategies. Awesome. So we're, we're coming up on time, but have a couple last questions I want to squeeze in before we sign off. The first is, so most of your work to date has helped us understand how link RNAs work, how they impact gene expression. And now we're kind of getting to the point where we have a general understanding of you know, what mechanisms they're using and how they're creating these spatial compartments within the nucleus. And we're switching to, you, okay, well, how do we apply this and how do we turn this into, you know, therapeutics. Right. And we've discussed some theoretical applications yeah. today, but I'm curious to hear, what do you think a company, you know, pursuing this would look like in yeah. 10 or 15 years? Oh, and well, that's a, that's, I mean, that's actually a really great question. And obviously, you know, <laughs> there's no right answer there. I mean, it, firstly, you know, there's no right answer because it actually it's, I feel like we're still at the very early stages of our understanding of how these actually work. So there are certainly things we know now that we can utilize to build you know, therapeutic strategies. But I, I wouldn't, I, I don't know what the next five years are going to bring in terms of, you know, uh, new paradigms and discoveries that could be potentially transformative in their own right. So it's a little hard to predict exactly what a company would look like in this space. Um, obviously, there are companies that have started to, that have started to arise in this space. I mean, for the most part, they tend to, you know, be along the more traditional lines of where I started, which is, you know, link RNA X does Y, can we, you know, Y is important for certain diseases, can we target it to affect it? And, um, and, 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 and those are really important. I mean, and I hope they're successful. Um, you know, is that gonna be the, you know, the end point of all this? 
Not necessarily. Um, it's a valuable contribution to all this for sure. Um, you know, I you know I am very excited about this idea of programmable molecules, um, spatially programmable molecules, and I'm, I'm I'm very excited about it. It's still a theoretical one, but you know it it exploits and utilizes sort of the biology we now understand that that the cell utilizes, uh, but in a way that gives us you know potentially precision control. And I think what's nice about something like that is you know, it's been a longstanding goal of uh, uh, I would say therapeutics to be able to get programmable control, whether it's cell type specific control or local lo localized precision control, right? There are whole classes of drugs called protax that basically utilize bifunctional small molecules that can recruit, uh, uh, that can degrade proteins of specific types by recruiting uh, ubiquitin ligases to specific proteins. You know, the idea that we can actually expand that to recruit different types of warheads to different places, not just to proteins, but to sets of RNAs, to, uh, to sets of DNA, to sets of, to sets of proteins. Like if we can recruit, you know, molecules that would target clusters of, of splicing factors, for example, right? There are, you know, lots of splicing dysregulation that occurs in many different types of cancers, for example. Those, you know, if we can expand that toolkit by utilizing this information, I think that becomes, you know, at least one implementation of this uh, and I think an important implementation of this of this um, longstanding uh, objective of, of of trying to engineer specificity. Um, and you know, one of the things that's exciting to me in the RNA space is the fact that you know, folks and I and I I'm not going to be <laughs> I, I'm not going to unfortunately give credit to every single person, so I apologize in advance for anyone I missed. But you know, folks like Matt Disney and others like like that who've developed small molecules strategies. Um, to define small molecules that can actually bind to specific RNAs, you know, I think really transform this idea um, and, and make this idea possible where we can actually think about designing small molecules or finding small molecules that give us that level of precision uh, 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 localization, you know, through those, you know, more accessible modalities. So I don't know. I mean, if, if, something like this came to be, you know, came to fruition in the next 10 years, I'd consider that a success. You know, will there be other really great things that will come out of what, you know, we as a field are doing in this space? Uh, I, I expect as much. Uh, it's just kind of hard to fully uh, do justice to what that will look like because I think uh, it's hard to know. <laughs> well, I look forward to seeing what comes out of yours and others work as kind of this field progresses. But I think we're getting to a point where uh, time start wrapping up. Um, before we go, uh, Mitch, where can people learn more about your work? Um, yeah, so probably the best place would be on our lab website. Um, you have some nice summaries of some of the different things we've done, as well as sort of links to all the different uh, papers, reviews, and other literature related to the different aspects of what we do, uh, the different methods we develop, et cetera. Um, so our lab website is uh, uh, gutman, www.gutmanlab.caltech.edu or linkrna.caltech.edu goes the same place. Um, yeah. Awesome. And uh, do you have any last closing thoughts or shameless plugs? <laughs> um, no, no obvious shameless plugs, uh, you know, and, you know, no, no, no additional closing thoughts other than, you know, what I, what I've already said to you is I think, um, you know, it feels like you know the next few years are going to probably be the most exciting in this in this broad broader field because you know we're we're finally past what I would think of as the initial hurdles. Um, we've learned a lot over the last few years, but you know a lot of the hurdles that we as a field have faced over the last few years have been, um, I would say, technical hurdles. Right, we have to overcome certain things to be able to start making discoveries. I think that there are certainly technical things to still be worked out, but I feel like we're past in many ways past that that bottleneck, and I think. Uh, you know, I expect there to, you know, just for it to really accelerate and, and, and what we learn uh, will hopefully just be, I expect it to be really exciting. Yeah, no, I totally agree. All right. Well, thank you, Mish, for an absolutely incredible episode. This was a lot of fun and you know, very grateful for your time. Yeah, it was great chatting. Okay. All right. Talk to you soon.